Welcome back to the Young Shakespeare Podcast. Today, I have the privilege of talking to Dylan Fawcett. He is a hooker for the USA rugby team. He's an Irishman, and now he is playing for uh, Rooney in the MLR. Dylan, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dan. Cheers, how did, man. Yeah, how did you get a nickname like The Butcher? Oh, long story, Dan. <laughs> you didn't mention you were going to hit me with that one before we started. Uh, no, that's a different story, Dan, so we'll we move on to the next question. Cheers. <laughs> all right well said um i recently i saw on your instagram you posted after the all blacks game something like a blessing to play with the best um i think a lot of people in the rugby world would be curious what is it like uh stepping on the field and competing against the new zealand all blacks uh, it was a privilege you know uh, just something that would i would have dreamed of, dreamed of doing my whole uh whole life you know career it was always the the All Blacks have been the pinnacle of the game. They've been, you know, they've, they've set the standard for so long. So to be able to get the opportunity to do that uh, with such a great bunch of lads was, you know, it was a real privilege. And, um, you know, they're they're just a phenomenal, phenomenal setup. Um, phenomenal, you know, on and off the field as well. You know, they really they really set the set the mark for, for the rest of us. So it's, uh, yeah, no, it was really special. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty amazing experience. And, um, what is it like USA Rugby as an organization, you know, being involved in the international play, earning caps and stuff like that? I mean, what is that whole experience like for you? Yeah. Um, so, my, you know, it, not, what I, not what I started off dreaming about. You know, I always dreamed about becoming the best that I could be. Uh, it didn't quite work out for me back home, but, you know, it led me to America. And it's just been, you know, a dream come true. Um, you know, I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've had with the States, you know, and, you know, coming here, I wouldn't have met my wife and we wouldn't have had our son. Uh, and just the, this, the, the, the amazing opportunities I've had here and the friends and, and the connections that I've made, you know, it's truly special. So um, to be able to represent the, uh, my, my uh, home nation now and, and um, or my adopted nation and my wife's home and my son's home and, and all their family, and, and the great people here, you know, really, really truly is something, you know, you can't really put into words until you're out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely incredible story there. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, you know, coming from Ireland and over here, and you've played in so many different clubs and leagues and been involved in rugby all over the country. How would you describe the difference in the style of play in like uh, an Ireland and maybe a European scene versus the American scene? How did the Americans play differently? Uh, the, the difference off the bat is that the Americans don't grow up with the game. You know, they grow up playing, you know, American football, basketball, all the American games, all these sort of stuff. Uh, so it puts them, it puts the Americans at a little bit of a disadvantage where we grow up with the game. So when we, when we come in, it's a lot of, you know, we, you know, we just have the, we're just ahead there, you know, and, uh, but the one thing that the Americans have is hard and, and they can, you know, bravery and, and they just want to get stuck in, you know. So there's some really talented players out there, and and you know if we can get it in the the grassroots, as we say, you know, if we get it in the the with with the young kids and we get them playing earlier, like the phenomenal standard, the standard will will go through the roof here, you know. And uh, I've met some unbelievable American talent, and I just see it from all the coaching that I've done. Like there's there's an amazing um there's an amazing ability here for it to succeed. So to be a part of that is uh. Yeah, well, I'm really lucky. Yeah, true. Yeah. Fantastic. And I'd be curious to hear, you know, from your perspective as a coach, I, I told you earlier how I play for NC State Club Rugby. Shout out to the Wolfpack. And uh, the coach always says guys like me that come from an American football background, you know, we tackle a little different. We do things a little bit differently. Our, our instincts, perhaps, like you touched on, we don't have that experience in that background. Our instincts sometimes are different. Um, do you ever see that? Like, as a coach, do you ever find, like, um that there's little tells or little um habits you would say from like people that come from a different sports background than rugby i think i think so the, not, not to make it not to make it too long but the difference in when you come from like you know baseball uh football background these these sports are anaerobic so you know you're not using oxygen it's not intermittent like rugby you know uh, i mean basketballers are great converts to rugby because they have that energy system like soccer players and uh, lacrosse players 
you know, they, they've used that energy, energy system for so long. So like they, they, it's very similar to what we do. Whereas like for football, it's like, it's one job and done. You literally have one role. So you have to make sure you're the best at what you do. Whereas like when, when you come into rugby, it's, you've got a, you've got plenty of things to do. There's always something to be done. So it's not just one job. It's the next job, the next job. You continuously have to play to be on the ball until the play stops, you know? So that's just the big, that's the biggest transition from these football and baseball and, you know, whatever uh, sports is that like, it's just moving from one energy system to the other. Yeah. Yeah. The point about the talk to the system of getting into that consistent, you know, play after play after play, you're always moving, you're always on your feet. Um, you know, in your own rugby experience with different clubs, how do you like to prepare best for that? Um, you know cardiovascular aspect is it just by playing the sport or do you like to um throw in um other sorts of cross training like uh running on the treadmill or the assault bike or swimming what, what kind of things do you like to do to stay in shape um to be honest Dan, I'm, very, I'm very lucky i've been uh, i've surrounded myself with and i've been lucky to meet such great snc coaches you know so you know to be the ultimate pro and to do what we do, yeah, you know, if you want to get the the one percent, you, you you know, nothing can be aimless. You can't do anything for just for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. So, I try to basically base my programs on you know periodically, so that I'm making sure that I'm the tip top each block. You know, so it's not like just going in. Oh, I feel like I'm going to bench press today, or you're like, actually, you know, chest a bit sore. I might do a squat. It's not really, that's not how it goes. You know, so. It's all down to all the the one percent preparations. It's the sleep, the fuel, the, the hydration, mm-hmm. the you know, it, just the preparation. You know, you sit down at, at the the start of your week. You know, we'd be a Sunday night and you map out everything that you need to do to succeed that week and and to be better than what you were the week before. You know, and yeah, I'm you know, I pride myself on on preparation. So, uh, my big hero growing up was Roy Keane and his. You know, one of his famous quotes was like, "If you fail to prepare, prepare to fail." And you know, I don't think that's—it's not a great one, but it's one of those things where, like, if I can do the little things and make sure that I am prepared in something else, you know, all—all all plans don't always go, you know, to plan. But if I can plan the best that I possibly can, then I'll be able to overcome anything that gets in my way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a, a holistic approach. There's a lot of elements that go into what you do to getting to getting that one percent to being a pro level um, rugby player. I was curious to hear. Um, I'm a hooker for the NC State rugby team. Um, you hook for USA Rugby. So it's a little bit different the levels, but same the same position. What would you say are the attributes um, someone needs to be a good hooker? Reps. Just reps. If you can hold down the scrum and throw the ball, like everything else will be easy. Will come easier. Nothing. It's not easy. But I'm, what I'm saying is, if you can get reps, if you throw and throw and throw, you'll become a natural thrower. You will get it. You will get it down. You know, as much as, as hard as it comes, it's not. It's not a very natural thing. But uh, the more chances you can get of, like, even when you don't have a six on six or one on one, you know, there's plenty of exercises now in the gyms and. You know, you can, you can, you know, you can really experience, and you know, uh, play with a few things, like profile work, and you know, different positions that are going to try and mimic a scrum. That if you, if you get comfortable being uncomfortable in these positions, then, mm-hmm. then you're gonna, you're gonna succeed. But it, it truly is down to set piece work. With what's is what makes the great hooker. Mm, yeah, that's yeah. a good point about the competition and uh, being able to do everything over and over and over. Um, I was curious to hear about uh, one of the key things, you know, being in the scrum is uh, that I think a lot of guys feel the day after a, a game is the the neck hurts. Do you ever do any weight training or exercises to strengthen your neck so it will hold up, you know, when you're at the apex of that scrum? It becomes part of your daily life. You know, it has to be. It also, like, if you can strengthen your neck, you're going to be able to withstand the G-forces, which, you know, are going to help you with potentially avoiding concussion. So all that stuff's gonna help, you know. I would I would massively have it in. It doesn't matter if you're playing in the front row or you're playing on the wing. Like neck work is really important to making sure that you stay on the field. 
Yeah, that's a good point. How would you describe yourself as a player for someone that's never seen you play? What's your style like? Um, style is, I think, one of the things that's made, made me successful would be that I'm coachable, you know? You know, I, I do what, what needs to be done, you know, and I, um, just a good, a good team, man. You know, I really enjoy being a part of a team. It's, it's one of the things I know I'll miss when I, you know, when I'm, the day comes when I have to hang up the boots, but just to be a part of that, that locker room or changing room and being amongst the boys and getting the guys ready to become the best that we can be, you know, and leave it all out there. It's really something special, you know, and uh, I think that's what I love the most about the game. It's probably what makes me the best that I am. Yeah, yeah fascinating. And it's interesting you touched on earlier about, you know, the preparation and all the thought that goes into the work you do. I'd be curious to hear, I know it's, um, you have a master's degree in exercise science from Life University, um, obviously um, very impressive and related to the work that you're currently doing. Um, are, were you able to take, you know, what you learned throughout that degree, throughout that graduate program and sort of apply it to the, the work you're doing now? You know, have you, did you, were you able to take some of the stuff you've learned and apply it to being a professional athlete? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it, the way I wanted to be, always wanted to be the best, even if I wasn't naturally going to be that, I needed to make sure that I was going to do it through hard work. So when I need, I needed to understand Right. This is what these are the amount of things I need to be taking in my diet. This is the amount of water I need to be taking. How can I, how can I build certain muscle here? Or how can I get more powerful here? Or, you know, um, and then just understanding like the, the 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 deeper science behind it. And be, you know, if I can learn how to teach somebody else, then I'm only going to get better from the same uh, you know at the same time. So, oh, uh, listen, it was one of the greatest times of my life getting that that master's standard life. Um, really something special and uh you know so fortunate to have it what are some of the misconceptions you think people have about exercise science you know when you walk around and and talk to people what what don't people understand that you can teach them about it sort of educate them on I, it's life you know like i mean the science is what makes up our whole being so like to be able to understand like how we move and how we and, and how we how we live is massive in translating on you know to having that fuller and better life, you know, essentially. So, you know, I don't, I don't really know if there are too many misconceptions out there, Dan, but, you know, if you're a man of science, you're going to, they're going to try, try to understand at a deeper level, you know? So, um, yeah, no, and, and, you know, for me, it could lead me anywhere, you know, it could lead me down the sales route, could lead me into a lab after, you know, or whatever. But, um, yeah, no, it was really, really, I really enjoyed it because it was one of those things um, that I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And when I left school and um, I just wanted to be the best that I could be, like I said. So I said, right, if I'm going to, if I want to do that, I need to learn about it. And sure, why not get a degree in it? You know, so, and then I got that opportunity to come to the United States and get my master's. And yeah, it's something I'm really proud of and I'll always have it. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations for that. You talk a lot about wanting to, you know, be the absolute best. I'd wonder, do you have any folks that are idols or sort of inspirations for your your mentality and the way you think, whether it's someone, you know, personally that you've known or even just a, a sports figure or sort of someone that you look up to. It's funny, Dan, we just did this as a part of our, you know, coming into the start of the season and like, you know, bringing the team together and, and you know, culture and bonding. And uh, we just done this as an exercise with our team. And, uh, you know, it was up to me to tee up the boys to ba basically, right, lads, this is what so I need to know from you who, who inspires you and what behaviors did they what what behaviors did they show that inspired and i was like it could be superman it could or it could be the built man you know mm -hmm. it, it, it just gave out quite random options right and uh, you'd be amazed the 90 percent of the 90 percent of the lads it was either their their mom their dad the grandparent somebody like that close that would be giving up so much of their time, so much sacrifice for them that it, it was so truly inspiring, you know, and I've been so lucky to have had unbelievable family around me. My, my parents, uh, they're truly the, the inspirational ones, so um, they inspired me to, to be the man that I am. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting too, and it's a testament what you said there, that so many of the guys decided it was someone 
personally that they've known someone that's been important to that and that you know there's people all around us to look up to and people that carry on every day and work hard and are virtuous and um, oftentimes get maybe overlooked in, in popular culture and that we look maybe to not the proper people for the, that kind of um, source and strength and stuff like that you know it's funny you talk about that exercise there what what do you think the importance is um with your role as a leader on the team you know how do you um, obviously you take that extremely seriously but how do you like to um lead the guys and, and what kind of things are you all about and that's that's a i i have grown so much through and like you know through experience that i you know i used to lead by being just a complete maniac you know i used to just do my like i i i felt like i had to be the most mental maniac on the, the field to, to try to inspire these lads and I've grown from from not being from the, from that guy to you know truly going from as, as you know you'd say the red brain you know where you're kind of out of control back into uh, to be able to get back into a blue brain where you can make cool calm uh, clear decisions on the field even when you're at at the peak you know when you're under most pressure so there's so much learning and I've been really fortunate to have such great mentors and great people with me alongside great teammates you know um that you grow together like the greatest thing i can say about a leader you know is having the generals beside you you know that it's not this is not a dictatorship it's never a dictatorship it's always it's always there you're always making sure that you're hearing different sides and like you know you're always being challenged to be challenged like and to be able to take it it's not always easy to take that to take criticism and you know and okay, what do you think of this maybe we won't go down this path and we go down this path and you'd be like well you mightn't think about it. you might get it that you know, mightn't think that's the right way to go about it that day but you come back the next day and you'll have slept on it it's just about time and, and, and surrounding yourself with the best people that's really what it is to be the best leader and to always be there to be able to listen um to be approachable yeah it's, it's and I, I definitely wasn't approachable as a young fella but you know now that i'm bit longer in the tooth i'm uh i'd like to say i'm a little bit more approachable yeah everything generals by your side i like that line a lot um and it speaks to to leadership uh certainly that you learn that lesson and um can apply it and work through it and make that a part of the way that you lead a team um i'd be curious to hear your thoughts in general about um, the MLR and rugby in America, obviously, where you come from in Ireland, rugby is, is a more popular sport. Um, and rugby in America is certainly a growing sport. Um, what do you think will be the keys to, you know, making the MLR um, grow in the future and uh, rugby as a sport in America and, you know, getting people involved? What do you, what do you think the keys to, to growth are in America? Fans. Absolutely the fans. If we can play a great brand of rugby that's going to inspire these people to come out and you know and give their hard earned cash and, and put it into this this great sport that we believe in and we love, then that it's gonna succeed. You know, I truly believe that they're the American public are they're definitely getting the bug. You know, the rugby bug is, is definitely infectious. So uh, yeah, I I truly believe it's the fans and then obviously trying to get into the grassroots. Get younger kids playing as early as possible, you know, getting the ball in their hands and, and you know, and then getting them to play everything until around, you know, 15, 16, and they can make a decision if they want to play it or not. Then they'll have so many, so many skills that they can apply to, to their game, you know? Yeah. And toughness too. I feel like that's a huge thing that young kids could benefit from in the, in the sport of rugby. Um, I'm sure that's something you go through a lot. Like, I, I think I, I wrote down one of the questions I wanted to ask was like, um what is what are some of the like injuries that are common in rugby players and like where as a as a you know a, a tough guy and a rough guy where do you assert the line between being like injured and hurt how do you figure that out to be honest then you're never 100 percent playing this game you know like that, that's just one thing you've got to get to grips with from the start so you know, because it's so attritional, um, you just you just learn never to be a hundred percent. So, to be able to, I don't know, man. Like, it's it's actually it's a great question because I don't really know how to, to answer that. It's I think there's this a, a deep love and a want to be a part of the the team. You know, there's 
is the desire to succeed. There's so many things that will get you above off your ass when you're hurting, you know, and you'll get you will get you up off the ground. You know, it's really easy. It's easy to lie there. But to get back up and keep going is a different story. So and that always that also comes from like your teammates around you. You know, when you're fucking hurting or whatever it is, excuse me, and one of the boys comes and gives you right, what you're we need you. Yeah, I'm, you know, there's there's just nothing like it, you know, and um, that 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 very much like no matter who it is, even if it's um, playing, you know, uh, D three with the Bayonne Bombers to play in professional sports. Once you have, you know your teammate has your back, you really can do anything. You'd be surprised at, at where you can take yourself. Yeah, yeah, crazy in it. Um, it talk it speaks too to I think the camaraderie uh, of a sport where you are in the trenches, so to speak, and where there is that um, physicality. Um, one of my friends I mentioned before the interview, uh, how I've got some Irish buddies now on the NC state rugby team, very fortunate. They're all funny guys. Uh, one of the guys, Fergus, actually a uh, great athlete, he tore his ACL. So he's an Irishman. He can't, can't play rugby now. And he's here in the States. Would you have any words of wisdom and, or encouragement for Fergus, you know, after suffering an injury like that? Oh, you'd encourage you Dan, to make sure that you're there for him. You know, because being injured, man, it's a dark place. You know, mental health is such a, an important part of it all. Like, there's nothing worse when you kind of do something that you love and, you know, you see everybody else doing it and uh, guys can forget, you know. So I would say, I would challenge you, Dan, to make sure that you're there for Fergus and say, man, I'm, I'm here for you. Let's make sure that, or you keep, stay on top of him, make sure he's doing his rehab. Make sure that he can get back as soon as, as soon as it's 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 uh, medically right for him to do it, and then for when he, when he's physically right, then I really think you know he's going to be in a good place. Yeah, that's a good point. Step up and as a as a friend, someone that knows him, and those are the people that are key and integral to you know helping someone out. Um, and like you said, it's so tough being injured and being in those places. Um, switching a little bit to a lighter topic, I'd love to hear. I mean, you're a a big strong guy. Do you have a favorite lift you like to do? Favorite lifts, I just compound stuff, Dan. You know, like um, I put my I put myself through a bit of um, hardship over the years, so probably not benching them as much as I w- would have when I was younger. But I still pride myself on on uh, you know the, the deadlifts and the squats. You know, I I, I love them so, and I, I love it. and again, once you're in the gym with the boys in here, you know, you're all getting around it. That's it's it really it's and it's not for everyone. Trust me, Dan, and it's one of the great things about our sport. You know, guys will do what they need to do. Some guys love it, some guys don't. But they know that it's part and parcel. Like, the, the gym work is just what's going to keep you on the field, you know? Then your ba- greatest ability in life will be availability. And the gym work will make sure you stay on, will give you every opportunity to stay on the field. Are you a guy that loves gym work and loves being on the field, so that's why you do it? Or are you a guy that just loves being on the field, so you're willing to do the gym work? No, I love both. Yeah, no, I, I love both. Always, I always have. It was, a, it was one of those things that that definitely, definitely helped me. Like I said earlier, um, not that wasn't probably naturally the biggest man, so I had to make sure that I was gonna be powerful and make sure that I was gonna be uh, noticed, so that I could get myself in the shop window. You know. Yeah. Here's another sort of just um, silly, more like cultural question. I was wondering about. I've heard that the Guinness in Ireland is better. Is that is that real? Is there, is there a difference between the Guinness we're drinking here in America versus the, the stuff you can get in Ireland? You can't beat it at home, Dan. I'll be <laughs> honest. You can't beat it. I, I, I haven't been home now in a long time. Uh, I do. I long for home. You know, I, I do. And I can't wait to be able to sit down with my old man or and my family and just have a pint of Guinness one of these days. But I tell you one thing, it'll be hard earned. And uh, it'll be a special t- special day when I do get home for it. Yeah, I oh, absolutely love that. Uh, I can only can only imagine what that feeling uh, would be like. Would be like. What is the? Is there a win that sticks out from your career, like a game you've been a part of that um, sticks out as like the you know one that you're especially proud of from any point in your career? One game that really sticks out to you? I think later on in my career now, Dan, I just I just relish every moment I can get out, out onto the field. Um, but I think I'll have to think about back to when I was younger like when I was you know I started off playing five and six 
and I grew up in a great club and a part of great teams. And then I went to school, uh, so high school in Blackheart College, and I got, I was part of a pretty special special team, and we were able to do to do the job in school, you know, win the junior cup and senior cup, and uh, you know, they're definitely some of the best years of my life. So, to be able to succeed like that and to be a part of that team was, uh, yeah, yeah, what I'll always cherish. Yeah, did I think um, when you were at Blackhawk, the the squad won the Leinster Senior Cup? Is that right? We, your uh, final year. What what was that team like, and what's it like uh, winning a championship like that? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, like like I said, so times I always cherish. I will always cherish like with my best mates. You know, like the school day, like they say, the school days are the best times of your life. You know, I'm very much, I live, I'm, I'm really loving my life right now and enjoying every moment. But to have been a part of all that was was truly special. And there were plenty of professionals that came out of that that side, you know. So, um, yeah, and no, I was just just truly proud to be a part of it all. Yeah, yeah. And you touched on about um, the upcoming season, how you're just savoring every moment on the field. What can uh, fans expect after this uh, preseason that's uh, coming to an end pretty soon? Yeah, so first match of the season this weekend in Houston. Uh, boys have prepared. Really excited about it. You know, it's great. Houston got a great win over the, the champions last week. So um, now we're we're just relishing the opportunity to get back out there and, and represent the great the great city in New York. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, yeah, we're we're gonna make an impact and we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, so I can't, can't, um, can't wait for that time to come and the season comes back. And I'd be curious to hear about, you know, back in 2020, the season was cut short. You know, what is your recollection from, you know, that time with the coronavirus and how did you, you know, manage to, to get through it? I know it was tough on everyone, but, um, especially in New York, but having, you know, the season cut short like that, did you, did you stay sharp? Were you, you know, getting in the gym? Were you doing stuff? I mean, what, what was that kind of, you know, what was that season like that year like? Yeah, I, it was one of the biggest challenges of my life, to be honest. Dan. It was really tough. I remember the season got cut. I was, I was the first person on the team to, to actually catch COVID. And then my wife had it and, you know, it really knocked us. Uh, so, not getting into details on COVID because everybody's sick of it now at this stage. But yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to hustle, you know. And that's one thing that we do here in, in New York is you had to hustle you had to make sure that right the gyms aren't open. I needed to make sure. So I was so I was so fortunate to one of my best mates, Jimmy Denise. He uh, played he was a former flanker, played for rugby in uh, New York, and he was uh, he lived thirty. He had a, he. Family had a warehouse 30 minutes away and he built the gym in it. And I used to drive out there every day to meet him. We'd run, we'd first we'd run, we'd do our running and uh, then we'd be in the gym. And, you know, we'd probably do about three hours of training a day. And uh, it was so, and then I, I, I had Ian Jones was our strength and conditioning coach at the time and he was sending programs and I, I, I literally every week for a year, just, just working out with Jimmy. Gyms were closed. And uh, you know, I, I came back just, just in the some of the best shape of my life and ready to go. And it was just, uh, I was honestly truly a blessing because I don't know what I would have done, I, you know, for my mental health state, mm-hmm. and to mm-hmm. what you know to stay ahead of the curve, you know, because I'm in the privileged position where, you know, at the top everybody wants that spot, so I got to make sure at all times that you know I don't want to give it up, and I know there's walls at the door, so. They're going to have to get up a little bit earlier to catch me out, Dan. <laughs> oh, man, I love that. Um, do you have a favorite move? Do you have a go-to move when you're running with the ball that you'd say that's your signature or your go-to? <laughs> no, Dan, you just have to make sure when you run with that, you got to make good decisions. And, and <laughs> at our level, if you're not running hard enough, you're probably going to get smacked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, um, well said. What would be – um your advice about like flexibility are you a guy I mean I know you've got the degree and um and you're a professional athlete so I'd be curious as like a hooker do you do any you know do you take stretching serious do you do anything like that to make sure like if the ball is you know being hotly contested in the scrum you can reach out with that leg and grab it I mean is that just in general in rugby or is there a special emphasis for a hooker to be flexible to make certain kinds of plays 
Yeah, uh, mobility more more so than you know you. If you've got good form in the gym, that the, all these compound exercises are going to help you get into that position. But if you're if you make sure that you're you're still mobile and you do a lot of mob mobility exercises, more being able to use your your body more than just like isometric stretching, to be able to get your body into positions through like you know using the poles or you know using like uh, weights to get get you into that area to stretch you and and you know. Um, and I do a lot of, I use a lot of band work, you know, so it hyper extends you so that you're into that, it helps you open up that muscle head. So, yeah, I do, we do a lot of that stuff and it's very much a part of our, our day to day. So it's like the neck work and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of accessory that you need to do, but like the compound exercises are going to really, help, are going to be the, the main focus and then the rest of it. But the, but the rugby is the most important, but all these other things make sure that you are always available. Yeah, and with your background um, with hurling and Gaelic football, are there any parallels with those sports to rugby? I mean, growing up playing those, is it just being an athlete that's helpful, or do you think you learned any skills or um, um, things that could translate over to the sport of rugby? Like I said earlier, the, it, both sports are intermittent, Dan, you know, and I, I, both, the, both the Irish sports, the Gaelic games are – truly unique and, and amazing that yeah you you, you learn you you it's, it's it's a proper test you know um i was i was fortunate i probably wasn't one of the best around you know i was i get a goal or two here and there but uh, <laughs> my mates were all a lot better at, at what i did but i, I used the skills that i learned in that and I became what i what i am today in rope in rugby you know so you know to be able to take high balls and you know make sure you know you don't sit and wait and you know, have the hand-eye coordination to play hurling and, you know, and, and being inspired and truly inspired because where I grew up, um, I played with, I played with my neighbours, I played with my mates, you know, you played with your community. So, you know, you, 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 you played for everyone you knew and wanted to be there for. So every time you were at a game, all your neighbours and mates were there at the game, you know. It wasn't like, you know, I go down. It's, not, it's, it's just there's something just so truly unique and amazing about it because you're playing for your parish you're playing uh, to be a part of something that you know we're, we're all ingrained in because we all live there you know it's a way of life so uh, that I, I truly owe a lot of my success to that to, the, to being a part of such a great club St. Martin's back home in Wexford yeah sure. <laughs> um, so um, final question before we wrap up because I know you're a busy man and I appreciate your time so very much um, final question, what would be your advice to a young rugby player, a young athlete that looks up to you that says, hey, I'd like to be a little bit more like Dylan. I'd like to score tries and, um, and be a guy who's in the MLR and stuff like that. I mean, what would your advice be to a young rugby player to get to where you are at now? I, 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 hard work. Truly believe, you know, if you want it bad enough and you work hard enough for it, you'll, you'll get there. Just be a sponge. Just absorb as much information as you can. Be a good man and be the ultimate teammate. And you know you, it'll be very hard to make sure that you're not picked. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Dylan. Dan, I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for reaching out, and uh, hopefully, to get you a few more subscribers. Yeah, I think so. Thanks so much to Dylan Fawcett for coming on the Young Shakespeare podcast. Thanks to everyone for liking, subscribing, and uh, please tune into the next episode of.